science knowledge only adds to the excitement and mystery and the awe of a flower. Evidence is evidence. It's public. Everybody can look at the evidence and assess it. And eventually, if there's enough evidence, come to the same conclusion. For newcomers and old timers alike, the Chloe Sanctuary hopes to give you insight into the health and happiness of your companion parrots. We hope to help you build happy homes using reliable and proven tools. The best homes are built on a rock solid foundation. And the best foundation for a happy home is the bedrock of science. When we stand on the shoulders of giants, the scientists who have worked long and diligently to understand our companions, we can reach new heights of understanding. And understanding is the key to success. I think treated, most of these birds have a good prognosis. And I would say in... What does avian veterinary medicine have to tell us about our feathered friends? How can we prevent illness, see the signs of disease before it's too late, and care for our birds through ill health? What light does behavioral science shed on their nature, needs, and hopes? How can the tools of behavior shaping make our homes happier for us and our companions? Shake. How can we deal with biting, screaming, or other misbehavior? What is it like to live among parrots, let them roam around about you and share a life with them? How much freedom do you give them? What happens if you form a bond of trust with them? Watch and see what understanding their true nature can do for you. Come with us on a journey as we do more than examine a parrot's world. We live in it. Make some popcorn and bring in a few wood blocks. Let everyone have something to chew and a comfortable place to perch. Cockatoot is a presentation of the Chloe Sanctuary for Parrots and Cockatoos, a nonprofit charity dedicated to the empowerment of captive parrots and public awareness. I'd like to do a big shout out to those people who make this video cast possible. Cockatoot would not be possible without our patrons. Thank you to those of you who make one-time donations. Without these patrons giving us of their hard-earned cash, we couldn't continue doing this podcast. I'd like to urge you to please give us at least a dollar per episode. We do two episodes a month. We'd like to do more, but in order to do that, we have to have the time. And right now, I'm spending a lot of time trying to beat the bushes for the Chloe Sanctuary. It's not easy taking care of birds that are severely damaged, both emotionally and physically. So, please, I urge you, become one of our patrons. And I'm sure that Peaches would thank all of our patrons in person if she got the chance. We try to answer questions from our viewers as we can. If you are a patron, be sure to email us at patron at chloesanctuary.org and your questions will take precedence. We always put our patrons first because they put us first. Hi and welcome to Cockatude, Cockatoos with Attitude. Episode 72, The Real Cost of Owning a Parrot. Well, you might think 
I don't know. What do you think, Lucy? You might think that owning a pair is just going out and spending, you know, $2,500 on a blue and gold macaw, or $2,000 on a Timney African Grey, or $2,300 on a rose-breasted cockatoo, and there is just a lot of money you could lay down for one of these guys, and you might think that's the true cost, but it goes a lot deeper than that. Um, you can get a palm cockatoo for around $40,000. Uh, but all of those costs are, they're just scraping the surface. There's so much more that goes in, into being with one of these critters. Are you a critter? No, it's not a critter. No. What are you, a Lucy? This is the Lucy, and there's the Cecil bird. Hi, Cecil. He's um, the Elvis of the bird world, aren't you? The Elvis of the bird world. He also does FaceTime really well. So he's doing FaceTime with me right now. Different kind of FaceTime than most people know. Right, little girl? You need to sit on my chest. And I'm going to put my legs out just because birds like to climb up and down on them. They do, don't they? Yeah. Pippa, I don't think that Coco is going to like that. I don't think so. So you could get one of these expensive birds I just mentioned. You could spend $1,000 on a, on a black-headed kayak or $600 on a sun conure. And you know, and think, oh, I've got this beautiful bird. It's got all these multicolors. You could spend $100 or more on a cockatiel. And maybe a hundred bucks or a little less for a budgie. You might even get a budgie for twenty dollars. But now you're getting a bird. Uh, budgies don't live that long. A bird might live eight, ten years, uh, less than a dog. Most of these, like a cockatiel, lives twenty-five years. That's quite an investment. And uh, they don't do well when they get transferred from one person to another. So, so what's the true cost? Let's let's frame this in a different way, okay? What's the true cost of having... Hey, Pippa! Yeah, don't go over and get on the camera. Thank you. Thank you, little girl. Good girl. She's gonna fly. You gonna... Where are you gonna go? No! 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 Okay. Uh, you have to let go. That's, that's the key. Yeah, well, you gotta let go. Yeah, this little one before we got her swallowed lead, so she doesn't always figure things out that well. She's getting pretty good, though, aren't you, kid? Yeah. We just recently found out that I, found, I heard this bird wolf whistle, and I said, I've never heard that before. And it was her. She was up on top of the railing where she likes to go. No, Pippa, you can go on the floor, but I don't want you going over to the chair. Pippa... No, no, Pippa, no, no. Good girl. Good girl. You see me, I'm using the reinforcers now. This is a secondary reinforcer. She knows what good girl means. Yep. And she understands the other word, the N-O word. So what's the real cost of having a monkey with wings living with you? You can sit over here. You can sit up here. That's all right. You can sit down here. No biting the other birds and no threatening. Come on. She she also grips. She 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 has that Velcro grip. And I'm sure that's just because of her lead poisoning, the after effects of lead poisoning. But so you've got a two-year-old with a pair of pliers and a foghorn. So. How long do you think you could stand 125 decibels? It's like a foghorn, you know, I mean, you're out at the stadium and some irritating person is blasting a foghorn. They can do that for hours, every two seconds, every second, and they can go on for hours if they're not properly, you know, properly dealt with. There's so much they need. And uh, no matter what you do, you're going to get vocalizations. Yeah, that's what we call them. We call them vocalizations. They call it screaming or squawking or whatever, but they vocalize and they're going to chew. These are not optional. 
Okay. So, if you've got wooden furniture, or furniture that can be destroyed in any way, um, they'll eat the... Well, you can see it. They've chewed into this. They've chewed into my clothing. They, if you're not paying attention, they'll... I see some. They'll eat the clothing right off your body. It's just natural for them. Now, that's not to say that the cost of, of replacing your clothing and replacing your furniture, replacing the molding around your doors, replacing your doors, I've had to do that, okay? Because they finally just chewed through the door. Um, I recommend solid doors or those metal doors with the foam interior. Uh, they're not going to chew through the metal, okay? So, that's your best bet, but see, although they're always going to chew and they're always going to vocalize, you can use applied behavior analysis um, or the subset of training tools we call reward training. You can use reward training to help them make better choices. In the old days, they used to say, I, I gave my dog the command to sit. Well, you don't give any animal a command you give them a cue okay there's certain things like when i put my finger out in front of a bird like this he's not going to do it right now but normally if i put my finger out like that they'll just step right up that's a cue finger in front of me looking like this like the letter d in sign language looking like this they'll step up okay i train them to respond to just the hand signal or i can say step up they understand that too so you can train some of this behavior so that it's less obtrusive, but they're always going to have it, and you're not going to get rid of it. Now, when you walk into the store and you've got your wallet full, or your purse is stuffed with money, and you decide you're going to get a bird, you start looking at the thousands of dollars you're going to spend. Now, that doesn't mean you can't try to find them on eBay, you know, but you're getting something from someone that could be sick. It could have many diseases these guys... Normally in the wild, they don't get many diseases. It's things that we've created in our world, mainly because we take large amounts of cattle and put them all together in a field. Um, and that gives a place for new diseases to be bred. And most of the really debilitating diseases these guys get are actually, they come from cows, okay? From, from herds of cows, and, you know, steer and that kind of thing. So they're called bornaviruses. And they're pretty devastating. Uh, and killers for the most part. So you're at the store and you, you really should rescue birds. You should find a bird that needs help. Learn about them and get a bird that needs help. Okay? Commit to that bird for life. That's the way you should do it. But let's just say you're at the store, you know, like the average person that wants, I want a bird, something different. You know, something I can keep in a cage and say, oh, how pretty. It doesn't work that quite kind of way. Remember, they're monkeys with wings. Actually, they're not monkeys. Uh, avians are much more... Um, they're much more friendly than mammals. Mammals generally aren't that friendly. So... And you look, you know, I've got $2,000 to buy a bird. Well, they've got a bird that fits right into your needs, but... It's 1500 and you need a cage. So a lot of these places will say, well, you, know, you can get by with this cage. No, you can't get by with a cage. If you've got one of these birds, they really should go into, if you're looking at a, you know, a sulfur crested or an umbrella or a macaw or something like that, they need to go in a four foot by three foot by six and a half foot tall cage. And that's still too small, but they can survive in something like that. If you get them a small cage, and if you think, like, like, here's a good example, you get him a small cage with small bar spacing and tack welds, he'll just pull it apart. I'll put in a picture of one of the cages that he just tore to shreds. I used to just repair them, but I did find a cage that has bead welds instead of tack welds. A tack weld is literally like that, like they just tacked it together a bead weld, they put a bead of metal there. He, he's actually broken a few of those welds too, but if it's tack welded, he'll get out. So, so they may say, well, here's this $300 cage, and you can use that for a while until you get a bigger one. Don't ever think like that. 
because the expense of going with a small cage can be a lot worse. If, for example, Cecil was in that cage, he could bust himself out within an hour, easy, probably faster, but within an hour, pull the cage apart, and go in and start eating your home. Now, it's not his fault. It's the fault of the clerk who told you, oh, you can get this until you can get something bigger. You know, remember, they're just capitalists, they just want to make money, and they don't care. They don't care about these birds. Now, and not to say there aren't some that do, but for the most part, if you're talking to a breeder, or if you're talking to a, a bird store, they're only in it for the money, okay? I'm saying for the most part, there may be exceptions, okay? So if you're going to get a bird, a small cage, with, which is going to cost you a lot less, right? Think of... Think of Steve Martin, the jerk, when he goes to work at the gas station and the guy gives him this little room, doesn't have a toilet, doesn't have any place to cook, there's nothing, really, and he doesn't even really have a key to get out of the place. Well, that's kind of what it's going to be for them. Now, Steve Martin was very appreciative of having this, this, this silly little room that he lived in, okay? It was okay for him, but it's not okay for these guys. Peaches is an amazing personality. Her daily maintenance requires dedication and mindfulness. She requires two forms of medicine, seven course meals, and effort to entice her to eat. Extensive preening in every day, special tools to trim nails, constant attention to her vocalizations, daily walks, and twice yearly checkups due to the possibility of impacted feather follicles and the nature of her spinal injuries. It seems a common misconception among the general public that parrots are like toys in a toy box. Nothing could be further from the truth. They are complex creatures. Recently, scientific studies have shown them to be at least as intelligent as chimpanzees. Every captive parrot needs special humans who will dedicate themselves to understanding them, those who know their species as it lives in the wild, special people that understand their social, mental, and physical needs. They need to be understood for what they are, and not as merely human companions, as circus performers to bring smiles. Peaches needs all this and more. She is our special girl. Will you help us care for peaches? Please make a donation today at our website, chloesanctuary.org. That's spelled C-H-L-O-E-S-A-N-C-T-U-A-R-Y dot O-R-G. As a special thank you for your donation, we will joyfully send you a postcard with Peach's happy face. It wouldn't be okay for you either. If I put you in a closet and said, this is where you have to live, you wouldn't be happy, okay? Then they'll sell you toys there that we call a Christmas ornament. What's a Christmas ornament in a toy? It's a toy that can't be destroyed. Or perches, they'll say, well, we have these uh, manzanita perches, or we have these ironwood perches. Well, what good is it if they can't chew it up? That's how they keep their beaks in good order. These beaks grow, okay? They, they, they're not static. These beaks are growing all the time, and they have to trim them. So if you get... <clears throat> so if you get them perches they can't chew, it's not good for them. And they're just going to get bored. And when they get bored, they get loud, or they start biting. Um, you don't take them out of the cage very often. They'll start to fight you going back in the cage. And this guy right here, this guy right there, can take and he can open a walnut in less than a second. It's amazing. He just goes pop and a walnut comes open. Don't you? Well, that's a Cecil bird. That's what the Cecil bird can do. Right? And that's what Lucy can do. Although I had to work on her beak. Her beak is almost normal now. And that's what this little one can do. Toys need to be destructible. Now, if you buy toys for a bird like this, they're going to cost you $15 to $20 a toy. 
Cecil goes through two a day. Figure the math on that. So if you're going to have a bird and you want to survive and give them toys at the same time, financially survive and give them toys at the same time, you're going to need to set up a workshop. You're going to have to have a, uh, a miter saw, you know, an 8-inch blade minimum. You're going to need um, a drill so you can drill holes. And you're going to need to buy chain and little plastic parts and everything to put between the wood. And you're going to have to cut wood into pieces um, like this, like these, or square ones, or different kinds of wood, you know, shapes of wood. And we don't color them. We used to, but they don't really care. And then you string, you know, we have a whole episode on that, but basically... <sighs> no! No! Okay, <laughs> it's always fun to try to get her off of something. Once she gets those nails latched into something, and you go to pull her loose, she screams and has a whole fit just like you're killing her. But you're not hurting you. We wouldn't hurt the Pippa, because we love the Pippa. We do. You know that. You know that, you big silly. So, we're not going to mention the vet bills, the toys, the proper food. you got to feed them pellets, but you also have to, and I suggest, cooking for them. You need to make them a mash. Uh, they need to have fruit and veg well, vegetables, a little bit of fruit. Um, so, a mash, we have a couple of videos on that. Bob's mash is the one that they get right now, and it has, it has pellets mixed into it. You need to have a full medical kit for them. You need to have super clot in case they get hurt because these guys don't have much blood. So if they start bleeding, they bleed out quickly. You need a hemostat and you need to know how to use it. So you're going to have to learn how to be able to pull a feather in case they break a blood feather. What happens is if there's a blood supply in the feather and the feather breaks, they're going to bleed out through that feather because it's kind of like going outside and taking uh, the valve on the side of the house and just turning it all the way on with, and just letting it flood out um, because it's arterial flow. So they're going to die. So you need to, ha you need to pick up some skills as a vet technician. Then don't forget the bandages. Not, not for them, for yourself because they are going to bite at some point. Uh, I mean, there are some birds that won't, and Chloe's never bitten anybody. Um, there she goes with grabbing me again. There you go. I put the chair where you can get to it. Okay? So if you have to sit in the chair, it's all right. I don't care if you chew on it. That's okay. Uh, let's see. What else? You're going to need earplugs and uh, flight-rated earmuffs. Believe me, there are times when you have to use them. When I put them on, I'm around 13 birds, okay? So when I put them on, what I hear is my titanitis. I hear my this constant ringing that my brain tunes out most of the time. Um, I can hear it right now because I started thinking about it. What? What cause? Okay, good girl. Hey, cockatoo. Hey, hey, pretty bird. Um, I say pretty bird to her because that's the only phrase that... I'm aware of that she knows. Um, 
So you're going to, you're also going to need to figure on replacing your wardrobe a little more frequently than you have been. Uh, Laura Life is a good example. She'll eat the buttons right off your shirt. She hasn't seen the button on here yet, I don't think. Laura Life. See the button? See? It's a button. Button? She knows what a button is. And now she's looking at me like, I gotta get over there and get that button. Um, now your shoes too, sometimes they just attack shoes because uh, it's not your feet. Um, if you want to go to the chair, you can now. It's all right. Pippa, that's all right if you want to go to the chair, but you can come up here if you want. <laughs> well, I know. That's a good girl. I'd rather have you up here just because I like to have you in. <laughs> you can sit on the chair if you want to now, okay? So they'll go for your shoes, uh, your furniture, your remotes, your keyboards, pretty much anything that they can play with. Um, so you got to figure that it's going to happen and you're not going to get too upset about it. Um, I like to think of it this way. One of my teachers said that you should always think of everything as being broken. So the glass is broken already. The remote's already been shredded. So when it does happen, it's just the inevitable. All right. And these guys in the wild, they're kind of the destroyers. Uh, and it's a good thing. Usually they destroy old, old branches and you know, they're, they're spreading seeds around because they eat part of the food and throw the other part away. And if you think about the food as having a handle, in other words, you don't want to get icky stuff on your hand. So when they've got that in their foot, they don't want to get icky stuff on their foot. So what they're going to do is eat it right down to that point where the next bite's going to get it on them, and then they're going to toss it. So I call that the handle, okay? Another expense is vet bills. Just standard, just a vet check with a with a CBC, a complete blood count. It's going to cost you about three hundred. If you're just walking in for a physical exam where they're just going to look at the bird, it's sixty bucks. So um, they need their own credit card. <laughs> okay, you need to have a credit card that's just dedicated to the potential for illness. Um, the potential for disaster. Hi, Cecil. You're so quiet. And usually he's causing trouble. That's what, well, when the cameras are up anyway. That's why I brought him in. I thought, well, I'll have somebody that causes trouble. And he's just sitting there. Such a good, he's such a good bird, though. You are such a good boy. And then, for example, with, with Peaches, she had, because she does have an injury to her neck, she has six fused vertebrae, so she wasn't able to preen herself, and nobody was preening her. So when I got her, she had impacted feather follicles, uh, two surgeries and a thousand dollars later, um, she was okay. It was a little touch and go. We weren't sure, you know, how the, far the infection had spread throughout her body, but so it, it could get to three or four thousand dollars in a year in vet vet bills, um, toys. One bird, if you have your own toy, you know, own toy shop where you're making your own toys, you can make a toy for about. Oh, beautiful song, Peaches. Beautiful song. Beautiful song. Is there another verse? Oh, there's another verse. Good girl. Come up here. Hello, Peaches. So, you know, toys you're talking, at, like with him, <laughs> that's, I can make a toy for about a dollar fifty. So, because you're reusing the chain and you're reusing the small parts, that kind of thing. So, a dollar fifty is three dollars a day. That's only ninety bucks a month for one bird. Now you may get a bird that only eats, you know, chews up one toy a week. Then you got to work to try to get them to do more because if they don't stay active and if they aren't engaged, then they're probably going to go insane. So you have to work with them to get them to play with toys. We're working with this one. She didn't play with many toys. She's starting to now. Yes, she is. Deciding to. There's so many things that can go wrong. Um, Chloe had a problem with her uh, her liver, so the renal shunt came in place, which meant she was bypassing her liver, and that meant that she was looked like a lot of pee was coming out. 
Most people would think that was diarrhea. No, that's not what diarrhea looks like. That's when the solids that they have in their poop break up and become indistinct. That's, that's, that's what we call diarrhea. When you get a whole bunch of extra water, that's usually a problem with our liver. So, blood feathers. I remember when Simone was here, she had a blood feather and I fixed it. And the way she told me she had a problem with her feathers, she came up in front of me and stuck her wing out. This is how smart they are. The next time she had a problem with her foot, she came over and stuck her wing out. So that was the sign for, I need help. That became the sign. And you'll find that with these guys, you'll get a whole bunch of language like that between you. Now, they hide their illnesses, so you're going to need a scale, okay? And you're going to have to learn how to read poop. So if you don't weigh them, They'll keep losing weight, keep losing weight. They won't show that they're ill. And then the next thing you know, they'll have to be at the bottom of their cage. And as Dr. Young at the Discovery Valley Animal Hospital said, one of the reasons he doesn't prefer to see birds, new clients, right, are coming in with a bird that's been sitting on the bottom of the cage. Well, it's already dying. So it's no fun. Now, it's great to see people who understand birds and they're bringing them in because they notice that there's a problem. Okay, um, but I usually hear from our vets that, wow, you know, nobody, norm, other people wouldn't have noticed that problem. Okay, um, they're surprised that I even saw it. Um, like the little tiny spot of a cataract in Peach's eyes. She's already been to the eye doctor. Um, although he said by the time that cataract needs to be fixed, he'll probably be dead and you'll have somebody else doing it. Because it'll be 10 or 20 years before that becomes uh, to the point where she's going to need surgery. And yes, you may have to do cataract surgery. That's not inexpensive. So Now, it's going to cost you some time for things you have to do. You're going to have to do daily exams. Okay. And you need to be equal to at least a vet assistant. If you're not, if you're not up to at least the standards of an avian veterinary assistant, um, you're going to have major expenses at the vet because you're not going to catch things when you need to catch them okay you need to be able to check their eyes and check their beaks and be able to open and look inside their beaks and you can do all that this reward training is all you need to know now it's a test of your will too if you don't think you can handle a bite you don't get a bird because that's the cost of owning one of these guys you don't really own them but the cost of having one is that you have to put yourself in harm's way when it comes to biting. They may just be doing it because they're afraid of something. They may be doing it to warn you. They do that. They'll warn you by biting. In the wild, when they reach over to bite their mate, they're biting feathers. But when they're biting us, they're getting skin. So it tends to hurt a little more than when your feathers get bit. And if you think that you can just get a bird and later on give it up because you couldn't work it out, um, the cost of that can be some real uh, guilt. It can fill you with guilt, and you may have to live with that for a long time. So that's a cost to figure in. So if you try, and then if you're trying to find a home for a bird that you can't handle, um, there are scammers out there who are going to come and take the bird and say they're going to take it home with them, and they're going to sell it for profit. Um, we used to have people show up like that at meetings. One couple showed up, and I found out later what they were doing. They were going out to the to the swap meet, and they were having people take pictures with a bird, and then selling the the pictures to people. So they wanted birds of every species, so they could pull different birds out of cages in order to make money. Right? We figured them out in a matter of a couple of weeks, and they never came back. Um, then you've got to train them to, to sit in a harness. You know, wing clipping really isn't an option. I know people will tell you it is. Now, most people think, well, you know, the, the wings will grow back. Well, that isn't always true. If they're cut improperly, they, they, it could damage them. And it could be the beginning of feather destructive behavior. I mean, these guys are all keyed into feather destructive behavior because they were raised away from their parents. So the chances of coming down with feather destructive behavior are pretty good, unfortunately. So uh, cutting the 
cutting the wings can cause that to happen, can cause it to break out. Although they all have that tendency because they were raised in captivity, um, if you clip the wings, you're just increasing the chances of that happening. And they can still get away from you. All they need is a little breeze outside, and they can catch the wind, and then they can't fly back to you. So that's not a good option. Now, they need the exercise. That's why you want them to be able to fly. Um, a paleobiologist was, was studying the, the development of flight in birds, and one of the things he, in his calculations, he figured out is that they only use about 10% of their metabolism in any other kind of activity. That's the maximum. When they're flying, then they use it all. So from 10% to 100% of their metabolism, that's why you need them to fly. So you got to harness train them, and then you got to, you know, there's a whole bunch of work to that. So that's one of the costs. Again, that, that goes into your time account. Time you're going to need to, to, to work with them. If all these expenses, if all these expenses seem like too much, well, get, get a dog or a cat. I mean, most people know how to deal with them. They're not, they're not an animal to get just because you want a change of pace, okay? Then another thing you'll run into, you go to a bird store and they'll say, well, this is Nick. Don't do that. Come here. No, nope. you're not going to do that. Leave her alone. Um, they'll say, well, this will make a good starter bird. There are no such things. All these birds are intelligent. Even the budgies are intelligent animals. They are not starter birds. They have their own personalities. And they deserve to be treated with respect. Uh, you don't get a bird as a starter bird so that later on you can get rid of it and get what you really want. That's just the wrong thing to do. Um, so there are no starter birds. Now people will get a little cockatiel and they'll call it a starter bird. They live 25 years. You know, more than twice the life of the average dog. And people uh, are going to get that as a starter animal now. And uh, budgies can talk. So, I mean, in fact, there's a, there's a video called Look Who's Talking. And they have a budgie in there that has a vocabulary of about 300 words. So, so you don't want to fall prey to the starter bird idea. So, the cost you're going to incur when you bring E.T. home. Most people have no idea what they're getting into. I didn't. I'm not saying I'm any better. I was starting to study uh, about birds, about parrots in general. Um, and then somebody basically said, you can have this one. And uh, that's where it all started. And I hadn't had the time to, to uh, get the knowledge I needed to work with them. Now I'd like to read you something that, that I wrote that means a lot to me. And uh, it tells a lot about the story about living with these guys. And then we'll come back to our regular <laughs> episode. And I'm going to use that time uh, to turn the air conditioner on so you won't be hearing the sound uh, of these birds during this. So someone's climbing on the... That's very nice. You're going to climb up on there? Okay. That's all right with me. This is our air conditioner time because it's 96 outside. Help for the suffering. When working with rescue parrots, you see many things. Suffering, neurosis, and psychosis. Often I see eyes darkened by futility. They have given up. They have reached the point where they would rather die than continue living. Life has become a living hell, where the one that they wanted to love has turned into a demon. Because of that demon, they become raving, screaming creatures that would do anything to make the pain stop. There is nowhere to turn. They live in a nightmare world. This is how most people come to us. As rescuers, we naturally take the first paragraph to mean the suffering of birds. Now, I'm not talking about a parrot being relinquished. I'm describing many of the people who turn over their birds to us. Often they are close to mental breakdown. They never dreamt that the sweet-looking, cuddly cockatoo they brought home would turn them into awful, spiteful people 
who throw things at cages and yell, Stop it! at the top of their voices. Often they have abandoned the bird to its cage because they are afraid of another bite. Many times they cover the cage to stop the incessant screaming. Most of them would feel contempt for someone who mistreated a dog. In truth, I think most of them feel contempt for themselves. They hate what they've become. Not all those relinquishing a bird come to us in this state of mind. Quite a few, however, do. What is the usual cure? We take the bird from them and let them return to their lives. Once the bird is gone, they no longer scream, shut up, while their faces turn into masks of anger and frustration. They no longer are consumed by the need to outwit the harpy that has stolen their peace. The incessant sound of squawking is gone. The beautiful bird they once wanted is now living somewhere else, and it doesn't matter where. They cannot help feeling that they somehow failed the bird, and this still haunts them. Time slowly buries those wounds. They feel as if they brought home a Persian rabbit and watched it slowly turn into a monkey with wings. Those eyes, those knowing and intense eyes, no longer look at them with reproach from behind the cage bars. The beak no longer threatens them with pain. The nightmare is over. It is our ignorance of their nature, our ignorance of the preventative measures, our ignorance of the antidotes that turns these beautiful creatures into living gargoyles. Bertrand Russell, the great Western philosopher, responded to the phrase, ignorance is bliss, this way. Only the ignorant would think so. Ignorance is not inborn. We must treat ignorance with the salve of education. I know I was once as ignorant of the plight of parrots as everyone else. Chloe was the stimulus that brought me to awareness. Because of her, I sought the knowledge that gives me the power to help them. Parrots and cockatoos take us by surprise. Even though they are a mystery, they seem safe enough behind those metal bars, and most people find that comforting. I can bring it out when I feel like it, and put it back, many would say. No one tells them that having a parrot is like having a five-year-old with a pair of pliers and a foghorn. No one mentions to them that the five-year-old will go through puberty and be a teenage five-year-old. No one mentions that they are the last true dinosaurs still living on land and reminds them of what happened in Jurassic Park. No one mentions that most will die if released into the wild. Parrots and cockatoos in captivity are still wild. You can break their spirit, but they will always be wild. Usually the personality changes come slowly over a period of weeks. A young parrot will respond to the inappropriate petting of a human. Most people sexually arouse these wild animals and bring out their protective instincts by petting them down the back or under the wings. There are so many pitfalls that in a short time the birds begin biting, screaming, and acting like angry children. Their owners unknowingly teach them to do these things. It's not the bird's fault. And since the people have no idea what a parrot is, it's not their fault either. A frustrated parrot can bring out the worst in those who do not understand their nature. Only education can change the vicious cycle of adoption, fear, loathing, and relinquishment. Rescues and sanctuaries are usually full. There is no room at the end. Just finding a rescue or sanctuary is hard enough, and placing a bird in a home is an immense hurdle. Finding those willing to help you to work out the issues with your bird is even harder. Most people do not look for help because they are already at their wit's end. Most of us were taught as children to take responsibility, and so we try to find solutions on our own. With parrots, this is a shot in the dark that usually fails miserably. They might as well be trying to live with a raccoon or a possum, except that neither are as smart as parrots. They give up 
and then find out that no one can take the bird. Guilt, fear, anger, and sadness often consume those who give up their parrot. All we tend to see is the malnourished bird with its chewed feathers and glassy eyes, like a doll's eyes. It's hard for us to see the suffering of the people who relinquish the parrot. It's true that some people treat them as a commodity and a source of income. I often wonder what makes people so callous, so unaware of the beauty of life. I wonder it myself, too, because my youth was spent just that way. But most of the people we see are those who made a hasty choice and find themselves in living hell, torn between guilt and frustration. If we can learn to see that both sides suffer, then we can apply a salve to both wounds, healing both the human hearts and the winged ones as well. The more we educate others, the less suffering there will be on both sides. I have seen the joy in a parrot's eyes that has a new life with a caring and loving companion. For me, nothing compares to that feeling. Nothing. To see even one bird love and trust again is worth the effort of a lifetime. As we spread the word about the true nature of parrots and cockatoos, they will find loving companions. We will also help others to avoid the heartache that goes with trying to own something beyond their understanding. Parrots live in a different world, far removed from humanity. They bring that world with them, in their genes. Education is the bridge between these different worlds. It is our mission. Saving lives is much more than rehoming parrots. Rehoming and fostering sometimes bandages the bleeding. Education has the potential to end the suffering once and for all. It is ignorance of Bob's nature that turned Bobaloo into a living gargoyle. Bob's would-be parents made a hasty choice and found themselves in living hell, torn between guilt and frustration. I have seen the joy in Bobaloo's eyes now that he has a new life with me as his companion. To see Bobaloo love and trust again is worth the effort of a lifetime. But, once again, Bob is heading toward the pain of separation. My heart nearly broke the day I discovered that he was heading toward a cloacal prolapse, that his life will be cut short. To find love and acceptance and then have it stolen away from you by failing health is too much to bear. We can slow the progress of his failing health, but we can't stop it. He will need several surgeries, and eventually, Babalu will die. We want to give him the best possible life until that day. His surgeries will become progressively more expensive over time. Won't you please lend Babalu a hand and donate to his medical fund today? Our donation button is on our webpage at www.chloesanctuary.org. Just be sure to say, for Bob, in the notes when you donate. The most important cost of owning a parrot is for the education that's necessary for you to know how to deal with them. Classes and books aren't cheap, and they're few and far between, so... Um, but I'm telling you right now, it's going to cost you a lot more to learn from the College of Hard Knocks. Now, you'll talk to some people who'll say they never had a problem with their bird. Their bird never did anything that was an issue. There are situations like that. I mean, you could have somebody worked who walked into a nuclear facility and was able to keep the, um, the, the nuclear power plant from blowing up. 
just by kind of guessing what to do. Um, that, ha that could happen, but it's not the situation you want to be in. You don't want to live next to a nuclear plant that lets anybody walk in and start playing around. With intelligent animals, it's best to have some skills, you know. I was at a rescue event one time, and there was a lady there who showed me her lip, and she had a little line from here, almost halfway down her lip to her chin, and she went, oh, super glue, and uh, a Moluccan that she had rescued uh, came over while she was sick in the chair, and she had fallen asleep and bit her lip, and she had to glue it back together. Uh, that's now the bird that she trusts the most, because she understands how to work with birds, and she worked with them, and, and, uh, and there was one gentleman who was telling me he felt sorry for his bird, so he went and got him a friend. And so when he put the female in with that bird, after that, neither bird would pay any attention to her. Uh, yeah, if you understand the way they work, you would know this. So what did he do? He got rid of them both. Um, lady with a military macaw and she said she had it trained because it would run over like it was going to bite her foot and she would grab its beak and then scream at it it liked that, it was a game the truth is the bird had her trained when he wanted to play the game he ran over and pretended to want to bite her toes and then of course Cecil breaking out of his cage and this situation here I can't let this go on too long right now they're preening heads and it's okay but if he starts moving anywhere else, this is a male and female situation, and they have to separate them. Um, that's right, Cecil, isn't it? You know. And you never know when one's going to develop a health problem, like Bob, who's got a prolapse. So, those can be expensive situations to deal with. Um, and Bob, he... When the place he was at tried to rehome him one time, the guy took Bob to his office and left him in there for an hour alone. <laughs> Bob decorated it for him. He pulled every key off of every keyboard. He tore the printers apart. That's what they do. If they're bored, they're going to they're gonna go in their environment and find something to do. You can see videos of them down in Australia and some of the stuff they do. Spinning around on high tension power lines and just and yeah, just they're just crazy. They they uh, they keep themselves busy, okay? And then when you get them, you may have neighbors and the neighbors may be you may be living on half of an acre, but the noise your bird makes may disturb your neighbors. And you may have problems with your neighbors. Um, so you have limited choices. You really can't live in a in a trailer. You know, a mobile home with one of these guys, they're too loud. Um, so you have to maintain, it costs to maintain their bodies, and it costs to maintain their minds with the toys and all that stuff, the environmental things you got to do. And a big cost is the time that you have to spend with them. They need to have interaction at least three hours a day. That's really just a bare minimum. So, um, now for example, with feeding them, most of them have not been fed well by their breeders because they're just trying to save money. And so you have to change the way that they eat, and it's not easy. Um, so feeding them and getting them to eat isn't easy. Uh, and this one right here, because of her physical problems, and because it's not a pleasure for her to eat, she gets a five-course meal every morning. Okay, And without that, she's not going to eat. She's going to be too bored to eat. So the cages, you know, the cages started at about $900 for an adequate cage for one of these guys. Um, and Cecil can break out of the king's cage because they tack weld. You would have to have the welds reinforced. So a stainless steel cage with the welds reinforced. Um, another thing that costs in time is you need to train them at least four days a week. Now, that's only 10 minutes for most training, but still, it adds up. 10 minutes four times a week, that's, you know, the better part of an hour. And you have to put them in a space in your life and keep them there and keep them entertained. Um, now, when I say keep them there, you're taking vacations. You're, it's a crapshoot, okay? You may roll snake eyes and come home, and I've seen it. 
I've had friends who, one friend of mine, she came home and her bird had just denuded its chest. Because she'd been gone a week. In the wild, when, when their mates disappear, their mate is dead. Okay? So, um, your vacations, if you can take them with you, that's your best bet. That's not easy. We do talk about that in one of our videos. And you've got to provide for them when you die. They need to be in your will. And they need to have a... Now, that's Coco and Lorelei, and that's two females, so that's okay. But um, you need to have a will and a pet trust. You can have money that goes into the pet trust when you die so that the bird, wherever it goes, which should not be to a relative that doesn't know anything about birds and thinks it's cute, okay? If you've lived with them for any time, you're going to know they're not just cute. They're intelligent. They have to be taken care of properly. So they need to go to a place where they're going to be cared for. So um, all this has to be figured into the cost of... of having a parrot. The upfront cost doesn't even come close to the real cost. And if you've never lived with a bird before, you can only guess at the ultimate cost. And one way you can get an idea is to educate yourself on them. Get some good books. We have good recommendations there. Study them. Get a little training. You know, Dr. Friedman goes around and trains. Barbara Heidenreich does that. Um, there is some online training that you can get to. And then you have to plan your life. You know, what am I going to do about vacations? Um, am I going to take them anymore? If I do, how am I going to provide for the bird? So there's a cost. Because you're going to be, you could end up leaving for two weeks and coming back to a bird that's either dead or has completely denuded itself of its feathers. So it has no feathers below the neck. Seen it? Okay, we've dealt with them. Ten of the birds here at the sanctuary had feather destructive behavior. Okay? Cecil didn't come that way. Cecil had, I don't know what to call it, doll behavior. He was so completely functionally autistic that he looked like a doll. And his eyes didn't have any, didn't pay attention to the universe around him at all. I've seen sharks with more life in their eyes, so... It can be too stressful for you to leave. So you have to have some kind of friend that they know. And that friend will be able to slide into that slot. No guarantees there. You may have to put them on haloperidol because they start pulling their feathers. you got to be prepared for that. For, the, for these eventual costs, okay? So be sure, be absolutely sure before you take the plunge... Uh, that you can swim. Um, there won't be any lifeguards out there looking out for you or the birds. So if you decide after examining these costs that you want to devote your life to a bird for the rest of your life, uh, I can honestly tell you that it's one of the most amazing experiences you can possibly have. But you, what are you doing up there? <whistles> Lorelei. I think she can do her own tail feathers. Lorelei, what are you doing? Just checking with you. What are you doing? So, <clears throat> and certainly it, they've done so much for me. People say, well, you're so patient. They taught me patience. Uh, it's not something I was born with. Ask any one of my ex-wives. Oh. Uh, was not a patient individual. And I was not the most positive of people. Usually I would be attacking myself first and then everybody else was falling around me. So they've taught me a new way of looking at life. Haven't you, Peaches? Now Peaches wants to get on my chest. See where she's sitting? And when I tried to move her, she told me no. She grunted at me like I'm staying here, so... Peaches and Lucy take turns sitting on my chest. I see you looking at those girls up there. You little Casanova. 
So peaches, since you're already in my hands, I guess you can say goodbye to the people. Peaches, you want to say goodbye to the people? You do? Why don't you tell them, Peach? If you want one of us around to make your life better, you have to make ours better too. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. We welcome your feedback on our videos. We look forward to your insights, tips, questions, stories, and pictures. You can email us at cockatude at chloesanctuary.org, reach us on Twitter at sign Chloe Sanctuary, and join with us on our Facebook Chloe Sanctuary page. science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower.